Hello everyone, hope you're doing well. Today in War Thunder it's time to look at the suggestions passed to the developers of February 2019. Normally this comes out at the end of each month, and on February, well, it came out just as the month ended. So therefore, uh, it's time to have a look at the different vehicles and also mechanics which are on offer. First of all, in this video, we're going to go through the aviation stuff, then in the next video, the ground forces stuff, and then we'll do a miscellaneous one looking at all of the other options. Now, uh, understand, as I've said before, for many times. Uh, the way to see this series of videos is this is kind of a sneak peek into these ideas. I will give you some general information about them, and then if you want to follow up yourselves, I massively encourage you to do so. I leave uh, the uh, links to the suggestions in the description below, so if you want to go and have a look at them, you can. And on top of this, remember, I am uh, not infallible. I do make mistakes, and uh, just as shown with like the video uh, talking about the new uh, German light cruiser, I do make mistakes, okay? And yes, it is very kind of you guys for pointing it out in the comments, and hopefully people will read the comments as well, but yes, uh, I will get stuff wrong. <laughs> just understand that. I am human, I will make mistakes while doing these videos. So yeah, if you want to follow up some stuff, uh, it's always good good to do so, especially on these ideas which may come to the game in the future. Right, uh, let's get started on the first one. So the first one on offer is some American stuff, uh, the YB-40 and the XB-41. Now, if you don't know what these two aircraft are, the easiest way of describing them is a YB-40 is a B-17, which is uh, stripped out its bombing capabilities and added in more guns. Uh, the reason why the YB-40 and the XB-41 became projects was because uh, America was struggling with the idea of long-range defensive aircraft, and what I mean by that is before we had the P-51s and P-47s with their uh, drop tanks, the B-17s were around and they needed somehow to defend themselves on long-range missions. One of the ways of trying to do this uh, was to put a B-17 or a B-24 in each formation, uh, which would be heavily armed. So instead of worrying about bombing, it was more worried about defending the other bombers around it. So the YB-40 and the XB-41 project was born. The YB-40 is the B-17 version. Basically, as I said, stripped out everything you could apart from all of the guns and adding in some more turrets. 1450 cals was seen uh, as kind of the norm, but it is known to go up to even 18. If we look at this picture here, we can uh, have a look at the 50 cals that are on offer. So you've got two here, four, six, eight, ten, twelve, and fourteen but it was also known to go above this uh, because they were thinking about adding uh, like a four uh, turret system or a four gun system in the front here and uh, there is obviously reports of this happening. There is also some stuff uh, which um, is shown that they experimented with different calibers of guns so not just 50 cals but also stuff like 40 millimeters uh, in these machines but of course this project uh, never really properly got off the ground uh, because of the fact that they did create the long-range fighters. So the long-range fighters eventually came along and dealt uh, with the situations that the YB-40 was supposed to. The XB-41, of course, being the other one, uh, the B-24 variant, this also had 14 50 caliber guns. What is also interesting to talk about with these two machines is that they also... Uh, they also incorporated radio technology when it came to some of their turrets. So the turret that you see on the top here uh, in this picture, and also uh, this turret here, you, uh, you can see kind of the smaller turret in the bit of the limp here. It was a radio compartment turret, uh, which means that it was con radio controlled. And then of course you have the turret which was added at the bottom here, which uh, is definitely another very interesting one. So overall, the basic facts is they tried to make gunships, they became surplus to requirements when the fighters got the extended range that they required to actually defend the bombers and therefore were not really needed anymore. Moving on, we have another American aircraft which I'm sure a lot of people will be happy to see pass. This is the Douglas A-4C Skyhawk, 
or the A4D2N Skyhawk. Basically, this is a naval jet aircraft. Uh, I would class it as a multi-purpose one. Um, I suppose more people would see it more in the attacker role. Uh, but the thing is, this is one of those uh, naval jets that the Americans had, which had a low set delta wing, which is really cool. It's got a lovely design on it. And also it had the capabilities of pretty much just carrying anything under the sun uh, when it comes to secondary armaments. It was also, uh, it was also armed with two 20 millimeter Colt uh, cannons so it also had that uh, going for it and also it seems to be a subsonic jet uh, so what that means is it ain't Mach 1 capable at least by the statistics put before here so what is the difference between the A4s that you may know and the A4C well the A4C uh, has a difference in uh, the addition of the AN APG uh, 53A terrain clearance radar, uh, which resulted in extending the aircraft's nose by about 9 inches. So this nose is, should be a little bit longer than the other A4s, and it should also have radar capabilities. With the fact that we just got uh, radar mechanics added to the game, this would be an extra feature for this machine if it was ever added. But as I said, this could carry everything <laughs> under the sun. It was obviously a naval aircraft designed to take off from aircraft carriers, and it's one of those, uh, I suppose you call them new age uh, jet fighters, which would be lovely to see in the game uh, at some point. It is very iconic, uh, especially to a lot of American players, so I'm sure we'll get it one day. The question is whether it'll be that useful, and uh, for me... I mean, it kind of, it fills the same issue that the uh, Harrier would have if it was ever added to the game, where it isn't a strictly fighter aircraft, it definitely is more of a multi-purpose aircraft, and because of this, uh, it won't really have a place in the game, because it will just get outdone by fighters, and then it will get outdone by uh, strategic bombers if they're ever added at the highest tier. So yeah, uh, that's something to think about. The uh, engine is an axial turbojet, J65W16A is its designation, and it has a two-stage axial flow uh, on the turbine, which is very interesting as well. But yeah, it's it would be lovely to see. Uh, it would just be, with the A4, it's just kind of which version do you choose, and I definitely think the A4C is a good choice, especially because of the new mechanics rolled out. Now we get something that I actually like, uh, the HE-70. The HE-70 is a tier 1 light bomber and a mail plane. It is one of these uh, machines which, in the 1930s, it was designed with the idea of being able to transport people and also be able to, uh, you know, send mail to people who uh, obviously wanted it quickly. It was quite a fast aircraft for the time, but uh, in the 1930s, of course, we had the ramp up to the war, so therefore the HE-70 had to find some kind of strategic role when it came to the Luftwaffe. And what they decided for it was that it would be this uh, reconnaissance aircraft, which also had the ability to be a light bomber. Uh, unfortunately for it, it has no offensive armament when it comes to guns, uh, so <laughs> therefore uh, it only had one 7.92 in the tail. Uh, very Well, not tail, but, you know, in, in a turret at the back right here. So uh, it fills a very similar role to the B5N2 with a worse bomb load. One thing to uh, actually point out, though, something that the Spitfire is known for perfecting, an idea which is uh, one which I feel like a lot of people may have struggled with in World War II, uh, since we didn't see a lot of replication of it, the elliptical wing. And the HE-70 uh, was actually able to create an elliptical wing, and in, well, not really... Well, I suppose you'd say it was before the Spitfire. I mean, it says here that uh, it has been said that the HE-70 was an inspiration or influence for the submarine Spitfire. I mean, you know, you can take that with a big grain of salt. Uh, basically, the story is the lads behind uh, the Spitfire chucked an engine in the HE-70 and were like, oh, the performance of this is pretty good. We like the wing design. Maybe we'll try a few things and uh, see what happens. But I think uh, saying it was, you know, influenced or heavily influenced, I mean, that's always a value judgment. So, you know, you can kind of, <laughs> you can either argue for or against. It doesn't really matter. But the main thing is this in-game would be quite a slow uh, machine. It wouldn't be very fast. It would be quite maneuverable for its size. Uh, and also it 
wouldn't have any offensive armament apart from the bombs which it would put under, which would be six 50 kilogram bombs or 24 10 kilogram bombs in an internal bomb bay. So at least they will be internal, they won't be sat off the wings, uh, which would be nice to see. On top of this, uh, the engine itself uh, is powerful enough to keep the aircraft going, uh, <laughs> but it isn't going to break any world speed records. At least at the time when it was built, it was nearly or even breaking some speed records, but we're talking about a machine that in the wartime would easily have been five years uh, past its sell-by date by any other aircrafts, well, by any other fighters, uh, you know, well, you know, by any other fighters' standards. So it was definitely on the low end uh, when it comes to the uh, the capabilities if we compare it to the frontline fighters of the time, such as the Hurricane, the Spitfire, and of course the BF-109. Moving on, we have a Yak-19-2. Uh, the Yak-19-2 is one of the first, or if uh, might even be the first uh, Soviet aircraft which had an afterburner attached. Basically, after the war, uh, they wanted to create uh, some jet aircraft. If you've read into the issues that the Soviet Union had uh, building jet aircraft, it's definitely a really interesting history, and I would definitely say, you know, look into it. And one of the problems we have in game right now which is pointed out by Epic Blitzkrieg, is the problem uh, that we have a situation where you have the MiG line, which is pretty good, and it's very fun to play through, and then you've got the Yak line, which definitely is fun, you know, with the Yak-15s and the Yak-17, but the problem is is they compare they they pale in comparison to the speed and uh, usefulness of the mig of the mig line so with the yak 23 added you've also got the yak 30 why not add something like the yak 19 2 which could give a little bit of life into the line and for people to play especially now that we have the mig 19 at the end of the mig line it's you hardly ever see any yaks uh, when it comes to jets which is kind of sad uh, because they are good aircraft you know the Yak-23 is really good, even with its BR increase. The Yak-17 uh, is really fun to use, and so are the Yak-15s. And on top of this, the Yak-30, it's not slow. It's a good aircraft. You just don't really see it uh, because of the fact that it's much better to go down the MiG line. But yeah, uh, so this is a prototype. Uh, there was two uh, Yak-19s made. You had the Yak-19-1 and the Yak-19-2. Uh, they pretty much used an afterburning turbojet, the Klimov RD-10F, and it was made from the German UMO-004 engine. You can see the difference uh, between the uh, two. Uh, if you see the comparison right here, so we have the Yak-19-1 uh, and the Yak-19-2. Unfortunately, this project was not really uh, accepted after the prototypes were created, and they decided to go different ways. Uh, an interesting thing is the armament on this machine is 223mm, uh, the 23mm being the... Uh, I, how do you say this, right? How do you say that? Shipitney? Shipitney? <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, SH3 cannons. It had two 23mm SH3 cannons. It has a decent speed behind it. I think it could fit uh, really well as an ATO, maybe even a 7-7 jet, and hopefully uh, we get a little bit more of a boost to the Yak-19 line, and this definitely would be one of those machines. The next one is the BAC Strike Master. Now, the BAC Strike Master it was a development of the Jet Provost Jet Trainer, and it was designed as a light attacker. And the Strike Master saw extensive use with numerous air forces from around the world, of which five still are also in use. What is interesting about this jet aircraft is the actual guns on it are much lower caliber compared to what you may be used to. So this thing sports two 7.62mm NATO machine guns. Generally, when we're talking about jets, especially of the more modern era that we might be used to, especially in the 60s and the 70s, we're normally talking about 20 millimeters, 30 millimeters. Uh, we're talking about missiles, all of this stuff. But no, the standard 
armament of this was two 7.62mm machine guns. But the hard points that it has, it has four of them, two per wing, you can actually see it in this picture here. It was able to carry £3,000 worth of bombs, machine gun pods, uh, air-to-ground rocket pods, fuel, drank, uh, fuel drop tanks, and napalm tanks as well. So overall, the versatility of this aircraft would be very good, very much similar to a lot of the aircraft we would see at top tiers uh, once uh, these ones are added. On top of this, uh, the speed of this is 834 kilometers an hour. I'm making a judgment here, just looking at it, it seems like quite a maneuverable jet. I think once again this would fit great in the Ato area. Uh, when I, Whenever I look at machines like this, it just kind of reminds me of the Nat. I don't really know why, but I would love to see the Nat in game at some point, alongside stuff like the Strike Master. The next one is the Mitsubishi F1. Now, we've just had confirmed that the Mitsubishi T2 uh, is coming into game, uh, so the Mitsubishi F1, I'm sure, will eventually come after the T2 does really well. If you don't know what the T2 is, uh, it is the top-tier Japanese aircraft, the supersonic aircraft that is coming to the game uh, in update 1.87, and the F1 version uh, is probably the best way of putting it, is not the trainer version, it is the single-seat version, uh, which is much much more designed uh, to actually be used for frontline service. So you can see that with the trainer versions, uh, if we go up here, uh, you can see that you have the two cockpits here on the Mitsubishi T2, right? Whereas once you switch to the F series, uh, the, co the second cockpit is filled with electronics and all of that stuff, and it only becomes a single seat machine. It still has the two engines, which is characteristic of the Mitsubishi. It is also an incredibly fast supersonic aircraft with a ridiculous amount of secondary armaments on it and it is a beautiful aircraft that's all I can say for it it is an absolutely lovely aircraft to look at and as we've talked about before the maximum speed of this machine is way higher uh, than whatever we have in game 1700 kilometers an hour you know that's what uh, that's well that's that would push it way past its contemporaries in the uh, in the trees right now. And that's where I'm wondering, now that we're going to have the T2, how much of an effect it is going to have, you know, with the, um, with the machines going forward. Like, are we just going to see a machine which is just going to be better than everything? Or are we quickly going to see something else which is going to rival it? Right now, looking at the T2, in, which is coming to the game, and the F1, they have very similar characteristics apart from as I said this one is built for the single seat idea it also has the six barreled uh, Gatling gun uh, I in the last video or at least when I talked about the T2 I compared the uh, Gatling gun uh, that's or the rotary cannon I should say that the uh, that the T2 has to the F2 the reason I did that was I was talking about damage and fire rate so a lot of people took that as I was saying they're the same thing. No. What I was saying was when it comes to uh, muzzle velocity, when it comes to damage done, that is what you have to look at. And the reason why I didn't compare it to the Vulcan on the M163 is because it's very hard to compare a ground vehicle's gun to one which you see on an aircraft because it's two very completely different scenarios. So a lot of people took that as me mistaking the gun. No, I know what the gun is. I know what it is. I know that it's a license-built version of the Vulcan gun. But the thing is, when we compare it, we have to compare it like for like. And for me, that is the closest thing like for like when I, in terms of velocity and firepower and damage that can be dished out right now at this time. Uh, so yeah, uh, I understand why people uh, called me out on that, but that was my thought process behind it. The next, uh, the next vehicle is the D4Y4. Now, if you didn't know, we have a bunch of D4s in game already, the Y1, 2, and 3, and I have vehemently detested <laughs> grinding out all of them because they have uh, very good flight characteristics. Uh, they don't have great bomb loads, though, and they have two 792 machine guns, and since they're Japanese 792 machine guns, they are incredibly annoying to use uh, because they're very low velocity and they don't do any damage. So adding another uh, D4 to the game, I would love to see it, uh, but I will not enjoy it, if that makes sense. You know, it's, <laughs> it's, um, it's one of those things where it's like, uh, 
yes, it's a World War II aircraft, it existed, uh, it was used in combat, let's get it in the game, but my god, is it going to be a pain going through it, you know? <laughs> you know? But basically, the upgrade of this from the D4Y3 is it had an improved engine, it also had uh, some interesting ideas behind it. So, first of all, uh, it had the Mitsubishi Kinsei 62 radial engine, the maximum speed was reduced to 552 kilometers an hour because it had increased weight. Uh, so the this version was crewed only by one pilot, but the bomb load was increased to 800 kilograms. So that's the interesting bit. And on top of it, there are technically two versions of the D4Y4. So you've got the standard version, and also uh, this uh, topic here, actually, if we go back up, uh, the cherry blossom actually makes a really good point. Uh, a lot of people do talk about how a lot of Japanese aircraft, especially if you look at the fact that they have very large bomb loads, at least some of them, and they're very heavy, uh, a lot of people make the point that they're designed specifically for kamikaze. Well, it, it would be very silly to create a kamikaze aircraft which had offensive guns on the front of it. It doesn't really make sense. It just seems like a waste of money. Uh, but also, there are some characteristics to this machine which do make it at least favor uh, the idea of kamikaze, but maybe not as a main role. So uh, the things that actually favor it, uh, if we look at the two, uh, the two characteristics of it, the uh, fact that there is uh, two modifications, if I can find it, here we go. So you have the early D4Y4, which has the 277s, then you got the rear cockpits can be clearly accessed by another crew member, and then you also have a few different things here, whereas the second one here, you have the 277 machine guns, uh, they were actually removed in April 1945, and the device that sends out the bomb outside the propeller was abolished, so this would be your kamikaze aircraft. So you've got two separate versions. Now what is uh, kind of uh, sad uh, is that this machine had a RATO setup and what I mean by that is the rocket assisted takeoff or at least that's how we see it, right? It's on the kicker right now. Now the problem <laughs> with uh, the D4Y4 one is it wasn't exactly always used for takeoff. It was used to propel the machine into an aircraft destruct, uh, sorry, into a ground target destructively in a kamikaze attack. So, if you want to add the D4Y4 in game, I feel like it wouldn't get the Rato system added uh, because it it would, uh, I mean, it would be useful. Uh, it would definitely be useful, but it may leave a bad taste in the mouth to some people. I personally say uh, add it if they want to. I don't think it would need it, especially if you go for this version here. But yes, uh, it should come to the game. It does have a bit of a checkered history, but that's fine. A lot of aircraft in World War II also had checkered histories. The next one is an Italian light bomber, the Caproni CA310 series. This was born out of the CA308, which was a transporter aircraft, and the CA309, which was a light reconnaissance bomber. Basically, uh, with the CA310, they decided uh, that they wanted to add a machine which had more powerful engines, retractable landing gear, and also a large bomb load, and the ability to be able to carry a torpedo. So, in true fashion, uh, what they did was they <laughs> they up-engined the machine, they added a bunch of, uh, well, uh, uh, they added a bunch of installments which would be able to carry torpedoes and extra bombs and stuff like that, but still, this thing was not exactly massive when it came to the bomb load. Remember that this is an early to pre-World War II light bomber, so we're not looking for anything massive. I mean, the comparisons to make right now in the game would be like the Blenheim and the Beaufort, right? These are machines which don't have huge bomb loads, but they're definitely fun to use, whereas this machine, uh, with its light bomber and reconnaissance idea, you would be able to carry around 450 kilos of bombs or one 400 kilo torpedo. So once Italy uh, naval comes out, obviously torpedoes are going to be a lot more useful, and uh, therefore uh, it would be nice to see more aircraft like this. You can see that the fixed machine gun in the wing route uh, also has uh, is present, and also uh, there is a flexible mount at the back. So this isn't just one of those machines which only has uh, turrets, it has a 7.7mm Breda Safad in the ventral hatch, and also a 7.7mm Breda Safad in the dorsal turret, 
but also the offensive 7-7. Uh, so very similar to the Spaviero in that regard, apart from the Spaviero has it more centrally mounted and it's a 12.7. I think for me, as I said, the closest comparison I can make is the Blenheim. It is a little bit underpowered compared to the Blenheim when it comes to its engines, but when it comes to its playstyle, it will be very, very similar. I would love to see this uh, machine in game, and also there is also a case for the uh, extra additional modifications that were made from the CA series. You have the 10 bis, and then you also have the 11 and the 3 uh, the 311, sorry, and the 313, uh, which could also be added to the game. So there is a great opportunity here for some really nice light bomber slash reconnaissance aircraft for the Italians. The next one is the Votor 2N. This was the most widely used uh, Votor, uh, or at least the Votor 2. It was a two-seat all-weather interceptor uh, with some radar in the nose, the DRAC 25 AI or the DRAC 32 AI, and uh, they, the pilot and co-pilots were in tandem seats. It obviously had the cannons, uh, the air-to-air missiles, and the unguided rockets, and there were 70 of these built. It was the most produced, as I said, of the Votor series, with uh, 63 being used by the French and 7 being used by the Israeli Air Force. So the uh, power plant is, of course, the SNECMA ATAR 101E5 turbojets. Uh, the four uh, 30 millimeter defers is still around. On top of this, uh, you have, of course, the SNEB rockets, then the uh, Matra air to air missiles, and a bunch of bombs. Uh, so, for me, uh, adding this to the game would make sense. We've just got, as I said, uh, the radar idea is starting to come to fruition in update 1.87. We have a bunch of uh, Votors in the game already, including a premium Israeli one, why not uh, have another uh, Votor, which would be incredibly similar to the others, uh, but would also have that killing capability uh, that we see from the premium version. And the last one is the Renard. Uh, this is an R38, and uh, unfortunately, the R38 was one of those prototypes which never came to volition because its competitors were too strong. So, the... R38, there was a prototype made, and they decided to, uh, and the, they decided to, they dis, uh, how do I describe this? So, basically, there was the Hurricane and the Spitfire. And the Hurricane and the Spitfire, at the time that they were created, were incredibly powerful aircraft in their own regards. The Spitfire being, of course, above the Hurricane. Same with the BF-109, you know, all three of these aircraft were seen as top of their game. So anything uh, that was going to go against them would have to be as good or equal to them, at least in some areas. The problem with the Renard R-38 is that it could not accomplish this, <laughs> and neither did the R-36. It used exactly the same uh, Merlin II engine, uh, but it was not able to, uh, it was still not able to put up the same amount of power that we see from the Hurricane and the Spitfire. So the R-36 used the Hispano Sousa engine, and because that wasn't able to go up against the Hurricane or the Spitfire, therefore this machine was also scrapped, because why? Why would you need it when you could just use a better machine? Now the reason why I want to highlight this is because the actual uh, plane is really interesting. You know, the actual design of it is quite nice. Uh, you you can see the inherent issues with it though, uh, <laughs> the fact that you have quite a large uh, engine hub here, uh, which would of course increase drag, but the main thing is uh, that do that shouldn't mean that this machine would should not be allowed in game. It could either have four 7.7mm FN Browning machine guns or two 13.2mm FN MG machine guns. The main issue though, of course, is uh, when it comes to this aircraft, it is a prototype uh, vehicle. So uh, it was test flown by Paul uh, Bernier. So at least there's that. The problem is, is where would you put it? Uh, in what tree? And also on top of this, uh, do we have enough information on it to be able to stick it in? And I think we do, uh, especially now that we know the weight of it, you know the power of the engine, it would be kind of easy to work out the flight characteristics of it if we didn't have full data on it. But overall, you know, it would be nice to see. So out of all of these suggestions, there is a ton of really interesting ones. We definitely span the eras. We're going from pre-World War II 
uh, you know, to the 1960s and 70s uh, with some of these aircraft. And I think that's absolutely wonderful uh, with the BAC Strike Master right here. So, yeah, I mean, it's, it's you know, what, 50 years? Something like that of uh, suggestions here, maybe 40 years. And that's wonderful to see. I hope that the majority of these aircraft get into the game at some point, but they're all great picks to be passed on to the developer. I hope you all have a wonderful day, and I'll see you next time.